Good afternoon. Welcome to the Georgia edition of our webinar series, Exploring State Findings from American Farmland Trust's Farms Under Threat 2040, Choosing an Abundant Future. Before we get started, let me run through some quick logistics. Everyone has been muted. No need to worry about background noise on your end. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. At the top, you see a little orange arrow. If you click on that, that shrinks and then expands the control panel. If you go down through that control panel, you'll see a questions bar. If you go to the far right-hand side in that little square with an arrow, you click on that and that pops out the questions bar feel free to put your question in there. It will automatically be sent to us and we will be saving time toward the end of the webinar to answer questions. Right below the questions tab is a handouts section. If you pop that out, you will get to a link to the full report. Um, you will also get to the state summary for Georgia, which we will talk through a little bit later. Um, also note that if when we are going through the website and looking at maps and that control panel is in your way, click on that little orange um, arrow at the top and it'll minimize the, the control panel. And lastly, we are recording this webinar. We will be sending a link to the recording to everybody who registered. So please um, feel free to share that with um, anyone you think might be interested. Okay, and with that, let me introduce myself and my co-host. I'm Chris Coffin. I am the director of the National Agricultural Land Network, which is an information and peer learning network, particularly for those engaged in saving farmland, whether that's permanent protection or simply retaining it in other ways. Um, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit at the end of the webinar. I also am senior policy advisor and I specialize in farmland protection, land access, um, and farm viability. Co-hosting with me is Billy Van Pelt and Mallory Osteen. Billy is AFT's director of special program development and senior advisor. Billy is a licensed landscape architect and has been working on land use and farmland protection for over 25 years. Mallory is AFT's first Georgia program manager and plays a key role in leading high impact programs to respond to urgent threats facing farming in Georgia, including protecting land from conversion. Mallory is a seventh generation Georgian with over seven years in the agriculture, land conservation and environmental outreach and education fields. So before I turn it over to them, let me just take a second to talk about American Farmland Trust for those of you who may not be familiar with us. We are a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We are also the only agricultural land trust that operates nationally. Some know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker, but the bumper sticker before this one said, it's not farmland without farmers. We understand agriculture and we take a holistic approach to it. Our national initiatives and regional programs focus not just on protecting the agricultural land base, but also on the practices employed on the land and the farmers and ranchers who work the land, both those on there now and ones who aspire to be in the future. Our programs and research inform our state and federal policy advocacy and analysis. We work from farm fields and kitchen tables to the halls of state capitals and the U.S. Congress with six regional offices and a headquarters in Washington, D.C. So let me now turn it over to Billy. Thanks, Chris. And thank you all for joining us today. We'd like to recognize and thank USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service for their partnership and financial support of our Farms Under Threat research. Farms Under Threat is AFT's multi-year initiative to document the status of and threats to America's agricultural land base. NRCS has been invaluable to this entire research project, as has our research partner, Conservation Science Partners. For this report, 
We also collaborated with the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Before I turn it over to Mallory to introduce our special guest, let me take a minute to talk about AFT's work across the Southeast. American Farmland Trust now has six full-time employees that are dedicated to working across the Southeast. And there's a total of eight employees actually living in the Southeast who are working for American Farmland Trust. American Farmland Trust based its decision to expand our programmatic and development reach across the Southeast based on our research and data, which clearly illustrates the need across our entire mission to support, expand, and develop AFT's work across this threatened region. And now I'll turn it over to Mallory, who we are thrilled again to have as AFT's first state program manager in Georgia to introduce our special guest, Mallory. Thank you, Billy. We are pleased to be joined this afternoon by Nick Johnson, Senior Planner with Georgia Conservancy. Nick helps lead the organization's work to advance sustainable community development involving both land conservation and thoughtful land use. Georgia Conservancy focuses on lowering barriers of perception and regulation that hinder increased building reuse, redevelopment of disturbed land density and smart growth as our communities must rebuild a robust local economy and strengthen the natural environment. Nick has led Georgia Conservancy's housing inventory analysis and, recommend, and recommendations for multiple counties and cities and has played a pivotal role in Georgia, Georgia now and forever, the historical land use, uh, land cover analysis and policy advocacy. Thank you so much for joining us, Nick. We are going to get your help in analyzing some of the projections we see at the county level on our website. We'll also um, provide time for you to speak to some of the work that you're doing and some of the things that you're seeing across Georgia, and then we'll include you in the Q&A at the, at the end as well. And now back to you, Chris. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mallory. Thank you, Billy and Nick. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we all are now going to go off camera so that when we show you charts and then the maps, you all will be able to see it um, at a slightly larger level than having to look at us. So let's dive into the methodology and findings from the report. The first two Farms Under Threat reports, Farms Under Threat, State of America's Farmland, which we released in 2018, and Farms Under Threat, State of the States, which we released in 2020, mapped past conversion of agricultural land, first from 1992 to 2012, and then from 2001 to 2016. In this report, we're looking forward, using this past conversion data to model and predict future conversion of farm and ranch land out to 2040. We started with the Farms Under Threat State of the State analysis of conversion from 2001 to 2016. As a reminder, that analysis mapped conversion to two different types, urban and high density development and low density residential development. So let's talk about those for a little bit and look at the, at the continuum of what these include. Urban and highly developed land is the traditional culprit in farmland conversion. It's been mapped and tracked for many years. It includes residential, industrial, and commercial areas, typically in and around towns and cities. It also includes rural industrial sites, such as oil and gas infrastructure and solar development. Anything that can be identified by satellite remote sensing as built up. Low density residential development has become a more pervasive culprit. And AFT worked with conservation science partners to pioneer an approach to map and quantify the impacts of this type of development on the agricultural land base. LDR areas range from lower density subdivisions to larger farmettes and ranchettes. Typically, this kind of scattered large lot housing fragments the agricultural land base and makes production harder for the farms and ranches that remain. It's important to note that some agriculture can be found on this low density residential development. We know that smaller farm parcels, especially those near urban centers, can be very viable and profitable. 
However, our research has found that once land has been converted to low density residential development, it is far more likely to be further converted to urban and high density land. So starting with this historical data, we projected into the future with a business as usual scenario. Basically, we made a straight line projection using the same annual conversion rate as what we documented historically to predict the level and location of conversion by 2040. We adjusted the model to account for projected population growth or decline. Building off that business as usual scenario, we developed two alternative scenarios, and we'll get to those two in a minute. In each of the three scenarios, we also mapped the coastal flooding risk that is projected by sea rise. Once we had our projections of conversion and flooding risk, we quantified the effects of these scenarios. We did that looking at both the agricultural land type, so whether the land likely to be converted was cropland or pasture or woodland, as well as on the productivity, versatility, and resiliency values of the land. As with any modeling exercise, there are some caveats. Most importantly, we were not able to account for local zoning. Land use regulations are inherently local and there is no national database of them. This means that our maps represent the general pattern and the rough amount of conversion that is likely based on those conversion patterns from 2001 to 2016. They do not reflect what may be allowed or prohibited on the ground through local land use regulations. Our modeling also does not include the impact of water scarcity and the potential fallowing of land because of water scarcity or salinization. Mapping this impact involves a complex interplay of many variables and was beyond the scope of our analysis. You'll see when we get to the website though that we did include a data overlay from World Resource Institute's Aqueduct, which offers some projections about water availability into the future. So here are the three scenarios we modeled. First, business as usual. Again, that's a straight line projection using that 2001 to 2016 data. The second scenario is what we call runaway sprawl. This envisions a scenario where sprawl actually gets worse. And we know that's possible, driven by high housing costs in more urban areas and more and more remote work opportunities which are only likely to be improved because of rural broadband expansion. Some parts of the country we know are probably already on this trajectory. Lastly, we modeled the future we hope for, better built cities. This scenario envisions successful efforts to reduce the footprint of residential, commercial, and industrial development on productive agricultural land. While the scenario still results in the conversion of some farm and ranch land, it envisions a future with vi vi vibrant, compact cities and towns and abundant farm and ranch land to meet the needs of the future. So let's take a quick look at the assumptions that went into the three scenarios. So you can see what we had talked about as far as business as usual. You see that we adjusted for future population growth or decline just in terms of that urban and highly developed land. And the reason for that is that there is a strong correlation between population growth and urban and high density development. You see that for runaway sprawl, we kept that same rate, um, the historical rate of urban and high density development conversion, um, but we projected a much higher rate of low density residential conversion, 50% higher to be exact. And in better built cities, we lowered those projected rates of conversion the low density residential to 50% less than in business as usual. And for urban and highly developed land, 25% lower, which we know from research um, is certainly possible in urban areas. So this chart shows each scenario's potential impact. There on the left, you see the gray, which shows actual conversion of 11 million acres in this century alone from 2001 to 2016. 
Under business as usual or worse, runaway sprawl, we may see another 18.4 or even worse, 24.4 million acres of farm and land, ranch land converted or threatened by conversion. Conversely, if we make smart choices about where and how we site future development, we could reduce that conversion to 11 million acres. You may be thinking 11 million acres is still a lot. Is that really best case scenario? AFT appreciates that development, including renewable energy development, is necessary and the need for affordable housing options is acute. While it may be possible for cities and towns to be even more compact in their growth, and we would welcome that, we chose what we believed was a realistic scenario. So these next two slides we hope are helpful in showing how Georgia compares to other states. This slide shows projected total acres converted by county. The darker the red or rust, the more acres that will be converted. Not surprisingly, you see the largest, the darkest reds in the southwest part of the state where there's a lot of acreage of land and agriculture. This next one shows percent of agriculture land in each county that is projected to be developed. And here you see um, the, how the picture changes and particularly in Georgia, where what we'll talk about in a second is how dark some of that red is in the northern part of the state. So this next slide, you see a chart of the, whoops, we are missing a chart. Anyway, we'll come back. This one? There we go. It just, sorry. <laughs> there we go. So here you see um, a chart of the top 12 most impacted states in the country by total acres converted there on the left and by percent of agricultural land converted on the right. These are not lists you really want to see your state on. Um, Georgia ranks fourth among states in projected loss of farmland acres with almost 800,000 acres potentially converted. While Georgia does not appear on the list of top 12 states with the highest percent of ag land converted, there are 14 Georgia counties that made the list of the top 50 counties across the country with the highest projected conversion of farmland by percent of total ag land. Gwinnett, Henry, Cobb, Muskogee, and Forsyth counties are all projected to lose more than 50% of their agricultural land base to development. Another key finding relates to impacts on our very best agricultural land. For previous reports, AFT created the first ever index of agricultural land quality that looked at the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of land, or what we called PBR. We consider land over a certain PBR threshold to be nationally significant land, which is what this um, map shows you. Land which we consider to be best suited for long-term cultivation and food production. While this land is concentrated in certain parts of the country, as you can see, all states have some nationally significant land, and you can see that by this map of Georgia. What we find in our future projections is that conversion of this land is likely to be higher than conversion of all agricultural land, likely because for the same reason that it is high quality for agriculture, it's flat, it's well-drained, it's relatively free of rocks. It also makes it very appealing for development. The loss of this land is especially concerning. This is land that can produce the highest yields of crops and livestock with the least environmental impact. Our modeling shows that nearly half of the projected conversion to 2040 will occur on nationally significant land, even though it represents only 38% of the country's agricultural land base. The more nationally significant land converted, the more reliant we become on marginal land for food production. And to put this potential loss of 9 million acres of nationally significant land in perspective, the total acreage of land in the U.S. devoted to all fruit and nut and vegetable production is just 10.4 million acres. So here's another top 12 list you don't want to see your state on. 
projected conversion of Georgia's most productive farmland is almost 348,000 acres. Again, this is land best suited for long-term cultivation and food production. And now I'm going to turn it over, Mallory, to talk briefly about the report's findings around solar. Thank you, Chris. Another threat that we highlight in this report is the threat that solar development poses to agricultural land. To be clear, American Farmland Trust supports renewable energy development. However, we think it's essential that we plan carefully so that our most productive, versatile, and resilient land is not compromised. We also think it's possible for agriculture and solar to coexist in mutually beneficial ways. This map shows the project projected acres of utility scale solar photovoltaics energy generation facilities by state in, in 2040. This data comes from the decarbonization with electrification scenario of the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Futures Study. That study estimates that we will need, there will need to be 7.4 million acres of utility scale solar in place in 2040 to meet the Biden administration's energy goal. We're now going to dive into the data available for Georgia on the interactive website. And for this, we're going to be joined by our colleague, Beth Frazier, who will be our navigator. Thank you, Beth. And over to you, Chris. Great. Thank you, Mallory. Okay, so here we are in the website, and Beth will put the link to the website in the chat at some point. Um, when you start, you'll be met with this handy overview. Um, again, you see it talks about what we did, what we found. It's, it's a short little summary. When you want out of it, just click on that X on the upper right-hand side. It takes you out. If you want to get back to it, you go up to the upper right-hand corner of the website where you'll see an About tab and bring it on back. While we're looking up at that upper right-hand corner, let's talk about a couple of other things that you see up there. You'll see a how to tab that takes you to a five minute video that explains how to use the various data layers in the scenarios. Next to that, the view report tab takes you to our farmland information center, where again, you can find the full report, the state summary, past reports and additional information, including the solar technical report. And we are making our geospatial data layers available to anybody interested. If you would like them, that request data tab is the place to go, which Beth has just taken us to. Again, you just click next, you fill in the data, and someone will be back in touch with you. So with that, Beth is now going to zoom us into Georgia. All you do here is you click on the state. When you click on it, it will automatically give you down below, you'll see the state level information, as well as information on whatever county your cursor happened to arrive at when you were on Georgia. So let's talk about what you see here. There on the left, you see the business as usual. Georgia is, we are projecting that Georgia would lose 798,000 acres of farmland. That gets even higher in the runaway sprawl and conversely gets much lower under a better built city scenario. On the right, you see that for every county, and that's what is great about this information is that we have county level data um, in terms of all these conversion statistics. Um, you see that by county. And you notice that the lighter orange is the low density residential development. The darker orange is the urban and highly developed land. And so you see that in Georgia as a whole, the vast majority of projected conversion is to low density residential development. So if we go down again, what we what I said earlier about the type of that we've looked at the type of land, both the quality and the agricultural land use type. If you see this acres of Georgia best agricultural land, that is what we consider to be the better half of Georgia's farmland based on our PBR index. And here again, you see that it's 330,000 potentially of this higher, very productive quality land that could be converted. Um, you see the numbers on the county level as well. 
And below that, you look at see that there's a lot of information about whether this is cropland or pasture land or woodland. Um, again, you see here pasture land seems to be the larger um, likely um, land type that will be converted with 351, followed by woodland, followed by cropland. Let me just say a note about the woodland. Back in 2020 in our Farms Under Threat State of the States, we devised a modeling system using data from the 2017 Census of Agriculture to project woodland associated with a farm or a ranch. So this number here does not represent all potential conversion of forestry land in Georgia. It is simply the woodland that is associated with a farm or a ranch, which we know is a very important economic, potentially um, uh, economic piece of a, of a farm. Looking down, you see here that we say that low density residential paves the way for further development in Georgia, that number is that it's six times more likely to be further converted to urban and highly developed land by 2040. So that's useful to keep in mind. And now let's take a minute to show you how you get to the two page summary right here on this blue download report for Georgia. So when you're in the website, you can go to that. We hope that folks will find this useful. We've tried to put as much information as we can into one document that can be used with policymakers, can be used as an educational talking point for folks with their organizations and members and donors. Um, we hope you will make use of this. What's important here is not just that you see the 798,000 number again projected, but we did some equivalency. We, using analysis based again on the 2017 Census of Agriculture, that if one converts that 798,400 acres, what, what is the likely impact? And so our analysis says that that means the likely loss of over 7,000 farms in Georgia, the potential loss of over 750 million in farm output, and the potential loss of 10,700 jobs in the agricultural sector. So this is a very significant um, potential impact. If you go down, you will see here that we have listed the three hardest hit counties. I would note only that um, we see a lot of them in Georgia, um, but these are the ones where we're showing, I think by acreage um, total, the largest amount of acres converted in those three counties. If you go to the next scrolling down, you see there's uh, additional information here that we, again, we hope you will find helpful. Um, but with that, let me stop and turn it over to Mallory and Nick to walk us through with Beth's help through some of the county level data and what we're seeing. Thank you, Chris. So Beth and I are gonna work together now um, to kind of cruise through this web app. So see um, some of the details for Georgia, and I'm going to invite our guest speaker, Nick Johnson, to join us to provide an on-the-ground perspective for some of these hard-hit counties. So as we noted in Georgia, Jackson, Henry, and Hall are some of our hardest-hit counties. Before we take a look at the map and compare scenarios, I want to pull up their legend really quickly to familiarize with the colors you're going to see. Thank you, Beth. So you see dark red is projected um, high, highly developed areas. Orange is the low density residential development. Gray is existing um, existing density. And then you also later on, you're going to see projected uh, sea level rise and actually in land acreage that will lose projected sea level rise. In OK, thank you. Now we're going to scroll into Jackson County. This was one of our hardest hit counties. And for those, for those of you who are maybe less familiar, this is where Jefferson, Georgia is. It's right along the I-85 corridor, and we are seeing a lot of, um, of development pressure in this area. So Beth, on the right-hand side, can you select the better built city scenario? So this is, so the, the better built city scenario is a projection of what we could see in Jackson County. Um, with with just a few you know with 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 um some smart growth um, policies in place 
On the left hand side, Beth, would you uh, select the runaway sprawl scenario? Thank you. So you can see pretty dramatically here in the runaway sprawl versus uh, better built cities, how much land, uh, agricultural land we will lose to low density res residential development. And if you look down below, you can see on the chart that we stand to lose 42, over 42,000 acres in Jackson County um, to this. In a better built city scenario, we lose less than half of that. Um, Nick, I'm gonna um, give you some time to speak to, to some of the work that you've done in Jackson County. Yeah, thank you, Mallory. So um, <laughs> we're, we're, Georgia Conservancy is fairly familiar with Jackson County. Uh, we worked with the Chamber of Commerce there to do a housing assessment of uh, the county and its cities. And I think the maps here really do show um, some of the things that they're already seeing in terms of the, the natural land that's being converted to developed land. Um, Jackson has a lot of smaller cities in it, uh, Jefferson Commerce and Brazelton, although Brazelton um, kind of extends into southwest into Gwinnett County as well. And so you've got three historic um, anchors for the county um, that really draw some of the services there. And then <laughs> the perfect storm happens where I-85 comes through. And because there isn't a lot of industrial land left in Gwinnett, um, available industrial land or, or land to be developed into industrial in Gwinnett, Fulton, and the core Atlanta Metro, there's a lot of development pressure happening up the I-85 corridor because it's such an important transportation and logistics corridor. Um, and so a, a lot of county leaders are actually quite uh, thinking, forward thinking about the fact that they need to th think about housing differently. Um, because they want people to live in the county for obvious reasons and the cities want people to live in the cities but and they want to maintain their character without um, becoming overrun with development and part of that character is the rich agricultural tradition that they have so um, it's been interesting to work with them as they figure out how to balance the growth the in, in, intense growth that they're seeing and uh, the protection of their land thank you Nick we'll also go scroll down to look at Henry County um, one of the other top three most hardest hit counties projected for Georgia. This is down kind of near Peachtree City. This is um, some of the growth we're seeing that's kind of come um, in Southern Atlanta that's actually making Atlanta and Macon feel a lot closer together. So you'll see on the right-hand side, again, we have the better built city scenario where there's still a lot of projected, there's a lot of existing um, development and a lot of projected LDR, but almost in the, in the left-hand side of the runaway sprawl, almost no farmland remains. Um, so in these scenarios, there's an opportunity in these counties for, um, for you know, to to support agriculture, to support um, zoning and, you know, um, farmland protection programs that can advocate for the protection of some of our best soils in these hard hit areas. Nick, do you have any, um, have any thoughts about Henry County? Yes, um, I'm not as familiar with Henry on a, you know, acre by acre, even house by house basis, but um, I know that the McDonough area in particular has grown hugely in the past several years and continues to be built out. Um, this is another case. I mean, Atlanta, the, I'll, I'll put on my city planner hat for a second and just say that Atlanta is a city that built its brand on transportation and logistics and, and shipping um, all the way back from the mid 1800s to now. It has always been that way. And especially now that the airport is the world's busiest. I think we still have that title. Um, but I think, you know, because we two interstates converge, um, uh, Henry County sees I-75, different kind of logistics corridor. Um, they're, they're seeing the repercussions of that. And this is a little bit anecdotal, um, but um, I, I know that the film industry also has set up shop uh, kind of in the east and south parts of the ring around Atlanta. Um, and so there's a lot of interest there uh, in terms of the development pattern. Um, expanding outward. Um, we did a little bit of work with the city of Locust Grove, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, to kind of assess their zoning uh, categories to see how they can get the kind of development that they want, um, which is closer to, farther away from the LDR and closer to the uh, moderate density category. Um, and so that's an, a good example of a community thinking about what they need to do to set up their their codes um, 
correctly so that they can minimize the impact to the surrounding landscape. I will say that Henry also um, has a really strong um, water preservation, I forget the exact name of it, but it's a it's a ordinance to protect watersheds um, because they're at the critical at a critical juncture for some of our um, our most important watersheds. And so uh, all of these different policies are different things that that people that uh, policymakers can do to uh, try to curb the spread of the runaway sprawl. Thank you, Nick. Uh, while we're still looking at Atlanta, I want to mention a piece of the research related to farmland protection. To show the relationship between compact, compact growth and farmland protection, we modeled what, what it would look like to add a substantial increase in permanent farmland protection in selected metro areas. And Atlanta was one of those areas. You can access the maps um, that we produced that were produced for this thought exercise through this drop down menu. We don't have the time to explore the data layer in detail, but the intent is to show how the conversion pattern might change if 10% of the ag land base um, was, was protected in the Atlanta metro area. This modeling may be helpful in guiding future investments in state purchase for agricultural easement programs. More information about this part of the farms under threat research can be found on page 34 to 36 of the report. All right, so um, now that we've taken a look at Atlanta, where, we, where we're certainly seeing the most development pressure and the most loss of farmland, uh, this is, you know, Georgia's farmland loss issue is not just an Atlanta issue. We do see the LDR um, focused around the sprawl in, in a lot of our big cities, including Augusta, Columbus, Muskogee County is actually one of the, the top uh, 50 counties noted um, in the nation, and Macon as well. We also, since Georgia does have a coast, we want to take some time to look at the Savannah area and specifically um, projected acres to be lost to coastal flooding. So if you'll take a look here, the dark blue is um, is projected um, uh, projected coastal flooding land. And so and this may not look like much land, but you have to remember that with this comes increased salinization of more of more acreage and then also inland migration that this causes and um, further further threats on prime farmland and further inland. Uh, Nick, I know I know Georgia Conservancy does some work around the coast as well. Do you have any um, have any points you'd like to add along the coastline here? Yeah, sure. Our uh, our coast is really unique and uh, my coastal director Charles McMillan I think is listening in to the webinar and so I'm sure that he will have uh, some thoughts to share with me if anybody's interested in in reaching out through Mallory uh, to me uh, to get some clarification. But the Savannah area is actually a really good example, in my opinion, of moderate density done well. Um, it's one of the, well, it's, it's a city where it has evolved over time in a spectacular fashion, largely thanks to the urban design um, that exists there. Um, and so you're not seeing as nearly as much and there are multiple reasons for this. You're not seeing nearly as much runaway sprawl in the Savannah area um, because they have such a, a, a good core uh, of development. Um, now, of course, also on the coast, your land is less developable. You've got salt marsh um, and high, highly sensitive habitat um, to plant around. Um, but that's actually a good example of what you were just talking about, Mallory, with what could happen if we had forward-thinking conservation policy? Um, we talk a lot about how the coast looks different, not just because of its geological and geomorphological features, um, but also because we have good, relatively strong protections for those really fragile and unique coastal resources like the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act. Um, and you know, 10 of our several barrier islands are protected in some form or fashion from development um, and so it's just a good lesson about how when you when you for when you think in a forward manner um, that you can actually preserve some of the natural resources that um, in a more effective way thank you nick and now with that we'll uh, leave the website and we'll hand it back over to chris Great, thank you, Mallory, and thank you, Nick. That was really insightful. Okay, so we're gonna turn our cameras back on. We're gonna talk for a couple of minutes about action, and then we will take questions. So if people have questions or comments, feel free to put them in the control panel. Again, you click that little box 
to the right hand side of where you see the questions tab that'll um, pop it out and allow you to write a question in there. So let's talk for a minute about policy recommendations. The report has policy recommendations in each of these four areas and at every level of government. So if you were a county or a municipal official, a state legislator, a state agency employee, or a congressional staffer, we hope you'll find a recommendation in here that you'd like to champion. And please let us know if we can provide you with any additional information about any of the policy ideas in the report. If you are a farmer or landowner or community advocate or you work for a nonprofit or an agency, we encourage you to share and discuss these recommendations with your elected officials and agency partners. So I'm going to just highlight a couple of things. Encourage smart growth. I'm going to wait because Nick and Mallory are experts there, and uh, I will just let them talk about that. I'm going to go straight to protecting agricultural land. So Congress will be writing a new farm bill in 2023. An important program in that bill is the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, which helps to fund the purchase of agricultural conservation easements from willing farmers and landowners. More funding for that program would certainly help to protect more farmland in Georgia. Advanced smart solar siting. AFT has been doing a lot of work on this issue. We have a wealth of information on our website. Local governments can ensure that best practices are followed when siting solar on farmland. So this includes best practices for construction, for the operation, and for the decommissioning of solar projects to preserve soil health, to preserve water resources, and to protect the ability of a farmer to farm the land during and after the life of the project. States can also invest in additional research, particularly around agrivoltaics or dual use solar, and provide incentives for dual use solar development. And then lastly, supporting farmland access. Again, there needs to be a next generation um, of farmers. States and local governments can develop their own or help to fund nonprofits who engage in farm link programs. So these are programs that work with both farmers and landowners who are looking for a successor or someone to lease their land, as well as with farm seekers who are looking for land to either lease or to purchase. This type of technical assistance can be extremely valuable in keeping farmland and farming. And we'd note that in Georgia, there is Georgia Farm Link, which is run by Athens Land Trust, a local conservation and community land trust. And now Mallory and Nick are going to talk a little bit more about smart growth and what else is being done around Georgia to stem farmland conversion. Thank you, Chris. Um, let's see. Come, Beth, can you transition the slide? Good. Wonderful. Thank you. Community planning is critically important for smart growth. As part of this planning, AFT encourages communities to plan proactively for agriculture by implementing family protection programs in their counties. And this involves these four basic principles that can work in tandem with efforts to plan for smarter, more compact development. Many resources on planning for agriculture can be found at our Farmland Information Center, and we hope that we, you check them out. Now I want to hand it over to Georgia Conservancy Senior Planner, Nick Johnson. Nick, it's clear from the Farms Under Threat 2040 report that Georgia needs to urgently work at the county and state level to implement agricultural conservation and smart growth strategies. Um, tell us a little bit about your work and what you're seeing on the ground. Yeah, certainly. So um, just a, a very brief background about Georgia Conservancy. Uh, we're a 55-year-old conservation nonprofit organization that was founded by Georgians at the height of the 70s environmental uh, renaissance and advocacy movement. Um, and uh, we started as a, an organization that was really focused on um, general advocacy uh, around our natural resources and protecting some precious places. Um, and since then, we have continued that legacy of advocacy at the state level and added a very local component um, in several areas, land conservation, land management, um, but also sustainable land use. Um, and so about 20, well, I can't do good math off the top of my head, but several decades ago, we started a 
uh, sustainable growth program, uh, which is where um, I spend most of my time um, as a planner, um, working with cities and towns directly to uh, do comprehensive planning um, to protect their environmental resources, but also their economic base and try to make sure that they had a competitive edge um, in, in, in can, in maintaining their character and growing the, their city and community. Um, and then also to um, plan for some of the ecological benefits that they have come to enjoy. And that looks different in different parts of the state. I think, um, you know, we see the ballooning of the Atlanta metro area in terms of its footprint um, because it's a desirable place to, to be uh, for a lot of people out of state, in state, what have you. Um, there are a lot of other places that are growing uh, in Georgia, and there are some places that are projected to contract, actually, especially, interestingly enough, in the southwest portion of Georgia, where um, the, uh, some, the majority of our prime farmland is, uh, a lot of those communities are contending with um, negative growth rates. And so part of what we do is try to um, encourage them uh, to adopt policies that attract people um, and help people remain. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is just this tension between proactive planning for growth and reactive planning against uh, land development and loss of character. And so I think it's kind of a, the tension is a double-edged sword because you wanna grow, but you wanna grow correctly uh, or smartly, I should say. You want to put people close to services um, so that they you know don't spend as much time in traffic, um, can can afford something within their price range that's walkable maybe or a short trip on a bike or even in a car um, and but then also there's we tend to see some some hesitancy about how that might shape shape the fabric of those cities and also there people want and need different things some people need a single family house some people need an upstairs apartment or a duplex some people want to live in a tower in midtown atlanta you know um, and so there's this tension between the idea that, you know, we we are creating codes that govern all of these different things. So, so one of the things that we try to do is help people visualize what a denser community fabric could look like. And I think that the idea of moderate density is actually like people people can be a little wary of moderate density or even just the word density period because it implies something that um, is out of scale with their community and so what we try to do is show folks that we have always in georgia grown or built or we used to build i should say especially before the rise of the automobile um, in a more compact a more walkable a more dense fashion and that's what we mean by moderate density we don't mean five over ones going down your your highway corridor ad nauseum you know, ad infinitum you know um, we mean maybe put a quadplex uh, close to your downtown square or maybe investigate if you can add a second story to some shop some storefronts uh, for upstairs apartments um, and so that's that's kind of what we try to to show people and but even what, one thing that we really like to say is even one or two units every unit can reduce pressure on your land farther away to absorb that growth um, and it doesn't have to be monumental to start with try something out um, that might work for you and then see how your policy can actually be supportive of that kind of development um, so looking at your zoning, which you all mentioned is something that is driven by the local, the local context, uh, looking at your um, policy mechanisms. Is it, would there be appetite for a transfer development rights program that would save land farther away and incentivize people to add a, a couple more units of housing closer in? Uh, even a purchase of development rights program or a land bank? Um, or do you have a community land trust or a, a nonprofit land trust in your community that could work towards farmland protection? So these are all questions that we ask communities as they go. And I think one of the things that we find most helpful is just visual examples of the kind of development that um, they want um, in different places, what a mixed housing neighborhood could look like and how it doesn't have to be scary. Um, and then uh, showing the economic benefits of it all. Um, you've talked a lot about large lot zoning. Um, one thing that we've done a little bit of research on is just how damaging large lot zoning is, not just to the environment, but also to a county's bottom line. It will not pay for itself in property taxes. Some counties in Georgia don't even have property tax. Um, you know, so <laughs> uh, that definitely won't pay for itself. 
Um, but also uh, it fragments communities, it fragments lands landscapes, and ultimately uh, you need a better balance. We've overbuilt in that area for a long time. And I think that a lot of people, you see it with like the return to the city movement, a lot of people are wanting some closer style development. So anyway, I'll give a shout out to a couple communities that I think are doing a really good job. Um, we work a lot with Covington, Georgia. Uh, Covington is kind of the next recipient of some development pressure from Atlanta. They're uh, about a 40 minute drive east on I-20. Um, and they are they have a very strong identity um, that they start, began to cultivate a long time ago as the Hollywood of the South. Um, and a lot of people wanna go there and a lot of people wanna move there. Um, some of your favorite shows might have been filmed there. I won't go through a laundry list because I'm not working for their economic development department. Um, but um, anyway, they they have, a, a, even in 2008, they had adopted some new zoning language that um, is closer to a form-based code um, than, than uh, typical zoning, which is basically, it prioritizes the design rather than the use of what you can put in a district. Um, and there are certain use categories that, you know, you can't, put an industrial facility in a residential neighborhood for obvious reasons, but it's a little bit more lenient. Um, and they're also interested in, they've invested in a lot of transit and um, bike ped opportunities lately. They have a new trail that just opened um, and they're looking to do some trail oriented development around it um, to scale. Uh, their, their building codes still have a height limit. Um, so anyway, but they're, they're thinking about the fabric of the city, how people navigate it and how it can lend to a stronger community. And then another community, and I know that we wanna take questions, is Brunswick, Georgia on the coast. Um, they, are, they have a lot of great building stock um, and a lot of uh, very passionate folks who have maybe um, come from away or from hometown, and Brunswick is their hometown, um, have reinvested in the community and tried to um, convert some of those buildings into new housing and retail opportunities to reduce pressure pressure further up in unincorporated Glynn County. So those are two cities that are doing great stuff. Um, check them out if you have time. And uh, I think their surrounding landscape will be all the better for it. Thank you, Nick, so much. That was very insightful. And I, I love, I appreciate what you said about low density residential development and um, county taxes. We see, we've seen in some of our AFT studies as well that um, LDR, you know, uh, uses more in community services than it brings in in taxes, while agricultural land uh, brings in more, more in taxes than it uses in community services. Um, yes. Thank you so much. So I think we're going to transition now to some question and answer, and Chris is going to lead us in that. So go ahead if you have any questions for any of us here on the panel, um, put those into the chat, and we will answer what we can. Great. So while we are on the subject of taxes, I'm going to pose this question to all three of you. Um, how effective is use value taxation on its own to help protect farmland? Might there need to be more expectations of farmland owners in order to continue to receive property tax relief under such programs? For example, long, example longer rollback periods and or preference for more environmentally preferences for more environmentally sensitive farming practices. Thoughts from any of you? Billy, do you have thoughts on that one? <laughs> well, I, am, I can... I'm inherently less familiar with the uh, mechanics of uh, our use valuation assessment in Georgia that we have. Um, so I, I am reticent to comment on it, but I will say that I think that there's a lot happening at the state level um, that I think could benefit farmers in the long term. Um, including the continuation of that program and adjustments to be made, but also um, recently in Georgia, there was a reinstated uh, tax credit for conservation, uh, which ha can be, uh, the language in those conservation easements can be written in such a way that working farms and working forests can benefit from a, con a permanent conservation status. Um, so if there are issues with, uh, with CUVA or some, some, rela some related mechanism like that, there are also other options. Great. And Thanks, Nick. Oh, go ahead, Nick. Go ahead, Billy. Chris, I'll just say that generally, not specific to Georgia, but generally across 
the country, um, and Mallory pointed this out earlier, anytime you have um, uh, development patterns that are a net loss on the taxpayer dollar, I think that, you know, any kind of, those are the development patterns that you want to steer away from. The importance of this research that Mallory and Nick have been presenting, and it points out how decision makers and policy makers can make decisions based on what they know is coming down the pike. So planning in advance, um, securing this productive, versatile, and resilient soil now to prevent the loss in the future. That in itself will help um, secure that land base and create development patterns that are sustainable. Great, thank you for that, Billy. I would, I would only add a couple more things. Number one, in general, American Farmland Trust believes um, that use value assessment is um, very helpful to keep land in production um, and would know that under these cost of community services that even that holds true even when land is in use value assessment. Um, the other point to make is simply that we, in our State of the States report in 2020, we did a state policy scorecard and one of the policies we looked at was that agricultural use assessment. So if you are interested um, in seeing how other states um, run and manage their programs. There are some that require rollback taxes. Some of those taxes get used for uh, permanent farmland protection at the county level or the state level. There are others that require written leases that again might be a way to encourage sort of longer, more secure land tenure for folks who are um, leasing land, but I encourage you to go to that state policy scorecard that will give you some ideas of how states are managing those programs. Um, there's another question here that I think I can answer. The question is, um, did we say what the numerical density for the low density residential development scenario is? I did not. That is a good question. And I will say in summary, what we did, what, this was again something we developed for the 2020 report. That low density residential development number is um, distinguished and separate for every county in the U.S. And essentially what we did was to take the 2017 Census of Agriculture, develop the, look at the percentile of county farm size. And so that LDR is the 10th percentile. So anything that fit below then that 10th percentile, so the bottom of the bottom, we considered to be very fragmented agriculture. Um, again, I just want to point out, it's not to say that there's not any, um, there's there can't be productive ag land on it. We know that there can be, and that small plot farming can be quite profitable and be very important. I think our point is, is that when you get that kind of large lot subdivision, it makes it very difficult for farming to be maintained on a commercial basis. Um, over a long period of time. And with that, seeing what time it is, I think we're gonna stop there. Um, I wanna thank you all. I wanna mention a couple of resources as we are um, uh, as we are wrapping up here. First, the Farmland Information Center. We've mentioned that is a place to go for resources. I encourage folks to go there. It is a wealth of information, both for statistics data analysis around census of agriculture, any other number of federal surveys. There's lots of policy data and there's lots of information for landowners and farmers. If you're looking for basic information about how do I protect my farm, 
that is an excellent place to start or the questions about agricultural use assessment, much more information can be found on there. And then lastly, let me make a plug again for the National Agricultural Land Network, which Beth and I are both involved in. It is a free network. We encourage anyone who wants to join to simply go to that um, URL site. Um, we, it's only been in place for two years. We are seeing growth, we are seeing interest, and we are seeing lessons learned from around the country. Um, and it's a very useful tool, we think, in promoting new knowledge um, and uh, practices that have been shared around the country. So with that, let me turn it back to um, Mallory to wrap us up for the afternoon. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I, we saw a lot of, we had a lot of information today. We saw a lot of um, uh, alarming numbers, but I want to leave you with this, that um, I'm optimistic. We have a lot of experts and concert, conservationists here on the ground in Georgia who have the tools and the expertise to deploy some of these programs. And um, we're, we're looking forward, forward to getting to work. So I hope you continue to see American Farmland Trust as a partner in your work. And please reach out with any questions. Thank you and take care. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Bye.